Welcome to a meeting of the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization. Consistent with Governor Patrick's rules around COVID, we're having this meeting virtually. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. Please do not unmute or mute yourself. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. You can find this by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of the screen and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom. The presenters will then call on participants and unmute their microphone. If you're on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Rogine Foley via the chat box at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA standards and revised Section 508 standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Rogine Foley of the MPO staff at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. First time on the agenda is the introductions. I'm David Muller. I represent Secretary Jamie Tesla here. Jonathan, please call the roll. Okay, Mass Dot C2. Uh, Marie Rose, um, representing John Bouchard, Deputy Chief Engineer at the Highway Division. Thank you. Uh, Mass DOT Highway Division. John Romano here. Thank you. Uh, MBTA. Jillian Linnell, representing General Manager Poftak. Thank you. Uh, Massport. Okay, uh, MAPC. Good morning, this is Eric Barrasso with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. MBTA Advisory Board. Good morning, Brian Kane present. Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Uh, Leonard Diggins, Advisory Council President. Thank you. Uh, City of Boston, uh, Boston Transportation Department. Tom Katz is representing the representing Mayor Kim Janey from the City of Boston. Thank you. Uh, City of Boston, BPDA. Uh, hi, Jim Fitzgerald with BPDA representing Mayor Janey in the City of Boston. Thank you. Um, at large, City of Everett. Uh, Jay Monty, representing Mayor Di Maria and the City of Everett. Thank you. Uh, at large, City of Newton. David Kozas, representing Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller in the City of Newton. At large, Town of Arlington. This is Daniel Amstutz, Town of Arlington, representing Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy and MPO Area Towns. Thank you. At large, Town of Brookline. Todd Crane, representing Select Board Chair Bernard Green in the Town of Brookline. Inner Core Committee, City of Somerville. Good morning, uh, Tom Bent, uh, City of Somerville, representing Mayor Joe Curtatoni in the Inner Core. Thank you. Uh, Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Town of Acton. Okay, uh, Metro West Regional Collaborative City of Framingham. Patrick Keezer representing Mayor Spicer, Framingham. Thank you. Uh, North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Eileen Nguyen representing Mayor Cahill from City of Beverly for the North Shore Task Force. North Suburban Planning Council, City of Woburn. Morning, Tina Cassidy for Woburn Mayor Scott Galvin. South Shore Coalition, Town of Rockland. Jen Constable, Town of Rockland for South Shore Coalition. Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. Town of Medway, Peter Pelletier. And Three Rivers Interlocal Council, Town of Norwood, Neponset River Chamber. 
Good morning, Tom O'Rourke from the town of Nord representing the TRIC subregion. Thank you. And our ex officio members, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, Ken Miller, Federal Highway Administration. Thank you. And Federal Transit Administration. Uh, that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next item on the agenda is the chair's report. Just an update on the agenda. We will be taking up Metro Common after our action items. So it will move up from 13th to 11th on the agenda, just so everybody understands. That's all I've got. Next is executive director's report, Tegan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for another um, kind of week to week, back to back set of meetings. Um, I think maybe some good news is that we don't expect to meet again after this meeting until early June. So we'll have a little bit of a break. Um, so I wanted to give a few updates. Um, the first one being that we did receive an invitation from Nancy Hardenden, Carl Quackenbush's wife, um, about a celebration of Carl's life this summer, later in June. I will share that with the board members soon, um, I think by tomorrow. And just to note that it does require an RSVP by early June, so you have plenty of time. Um, but please do note that the RSVP is needed so that Nancy can plan for attendance. Um, so please keep an eye on that for me, from me. Um, uh, the next update is, I, as I mentioned last week, we had our new Director of Projects and Partnerships, Rebecca Morgan, start this week. Um, I did mention before that this is a revised director position that replaces the Director of Technical Services. And Rebecca in this new position will be um, heavily invested in building relationships and advancing our best practices around our project delivery. So um, I've already summarized a bit about her for you. And what I was hoping is that she could just um, kind of show her face in the meeting and say a very, very quick hello so that you'll recognize her when you see her next time. Um, Rebecca, are you there? Yes, Tegan. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, as Tegan mentioned, um, good morning. Um, the Director of Projects and Partnerships with CTPS. My experience includes transportation consulting and leadership and trans in all areas of transportation, but mainly highways, transit, as well as container terminal management. And I served in leadership roles previously at IBI Group, where I was an associate director, as well as a director at the International Port Management. I'm just glad to be here and I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Rebecca. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions um, or want to meet her. Um, and then with that, I will move on to our outreach updates. So those include, first of all, I wanted to thank those of you who attended the history of the, um, the MBTA spider map event that we had with Ken Dumas. Um, it's definitely worth seeing it if you weren't able to attend. So if you would like to see it, please do check out the video, which is on our MPO YouTube channel. Um, you certainly won't regret it. And then um, I also wanted to highlight again that we do have two upcoming virtual tip open houses that I men mentioned last time, but now the um, details and the registration links are on the MPO calendar. They're on May 10th at noon and May 19th at 4 p.m. So please take a look at the MPO calendar and sign up if you're interested or encourage others to. Um, and then I also mentioned last time that we are holding a series of coffee chats for the MPO's pilot transit working group. And those will be focused on topics like microtransit, partnerships, closing gaps, um, among other things. Many of the coffee chats that we scheduled are actually already at capacity. So we'll discuss how they went at the next general transit working group meeting, likely in June. Um, so also keep an eye out for that transit working group meeting. If you're interested and contact Michelle Scott, um, scott at ctps.org if you have questions. Um, and then finally, another outreach item or kind of a, an outreach and study item is that we've been working to select locations for the MPO funded um, discrete study called the Central Business Districts Part Two. And we've narrowed down the list for those, those locations. And we knew the board was interested in what CBDs were you know, selected for that. So we will be sending out an email to members next week um, about to get your input about the final selections for those locations. So for today, um, we have one scope uh, for your review and approval to kick off our work supporting the MBTA for their state fiscal year 2022 national transit database work. Um, and then in addition, we have five substantive items. There are two votes um, to release for 21 day public comment period. The first one is the federal fiscal year 22 to 26 tip. 
Um, that's the new one that you just approved about a month ago, your preferred programming scenario for. And then there will also be an amendment six for the current federal fiscal year 21 through 25 tip. So again, we'll ask you to vote to release both of them for 20 day, 21 day public review period. Um, and then in other topics, we'll hear from MAPC on their regional land use plan, Metro Common 2050. Um, and I'll talk about some things that are happening this month, as well as the way their land use plan connects to the um, MPO's new long range transportation plan, which we're calling Destination 2050. And then finally, we have two studies that we'll report on, and these studies um, really focus on the MPO goals for safety, maintaining the transportation system, advancing mobility, and reducing emissions. Um, the first is our MPO funded safety and operations study. And the two locations that we looked at and recommended um, intersection improvements were at Route 27 at West Street in Medfield and um, Adams Street at Furnace Brook Parkway and Common Street in Quincy. So as usual, there's a report online that's a really impressive body of work. And Yen or Chen Yuan Wang will be sharing just the highlights of that work in a brief presentation. And then we'll also hear from Casey Marie Claude on the High Bicycle and Pedestrian Crash Location Study, which took place in Chelsea, um, Lynn and Malden. And that work focuses on safety, mobility, and comfort for people walking and biking. And um, it looks at both why there are crashes and as well as we're recommending um, conceptual improvements. Okay, and finally, the next board meeting, as I mentioned, is a little ways off on June 3rd. The primary goal of that meeting will be the final endorsement of the 22 to 26 tip and the amendment six that you vote out today, if you choose. And then we will also be hoping to present on the results of the um, federal fiscal year 2020 sub-regional priority roadway study, which is Route 53 um, corridor in Norwell. So these studies were being wrapped up um, later than um, originally anticipated due to COVID um, and difficulty in getting traffic counts. And then we'll also hopefully be talking about the CTPS five-year strategic plan, which I'm in discussion with the chair and the vice chair with about right now. And that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dagan. Any questions for Dagan? Seeing and hearing none, next item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment at this time? If so, please raise your hand. I see a hand raised. Julie DeMauro. Good morning, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, I just would like to just speak briefly about uh, the city of Riviera and the town of Saugus intention to initiate a project onto the chip cycle um, in the next round of chip consideration. Um, and that would be the Riviera Saugus roadway widening project for Route 1 North. Um, and this project is just isn't about improving traffic flow for vehicles, but it's also about um, expanding and providing additional mobility option for our pedestrian and cyclists living and working in the area. Um, so this project actually has a MassDOT number of 611999, um, and we're working with MassDOT um, on this project as well as to coordinate with their roadway widening project of 610543. So we just want to bring this to the attention of the MPO board. Um, and I'm gonna be working with Matt um, and Kate to start the dialogue about how we can strategically advance this project onto the chip in the future years. Thank you, Mr. Mar. Any questions? Seeing none, is there any other person from the public who would like to comment at this time? Seeing and hearing none, if you want to comment during the meeting, please raise your hand and we will try to call on you. Next item is the Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I believe it's the committee chair's reports uh, oh. that are up next. <laughs> thank you. Ben Muller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, ben Muller, MassDOT Planning here and Chair of the UPWP Committee. Just wanted to give a quick reminder that the UPWP Committee will be meeting uh, directly after this meeting today. You can find the link on the meeting calendar on the MPO's website. And the bulk of the conversation will be finalizing a recommended list of studies for federal fiscal year 2022. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Any other committee chairs at this time? Seeing none. Now it's the Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn?
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, <laughs> I'm getting my heart out of my throat because when I saw Ben, I thought maybe I had missed the UPWP meeting. So anyways, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so um, at our, our meeting, like some, we haven't had a meeting since last time. And at our meeting coming up on the 12th, we're going to have Sandy Johnston and Ariel Patterson talk to us about innovations in trip generation. They had talked to the MPO about that a while ago, and uh, I think it's really worthy of following up. So I'm very excited about that. And we'll also be reviewing chapter seven of the um, one Rings, the needs assessment of the one Rings transportation plan. I'm also excited about our June meeting uh, because we're going to have Matthew Raisman from um, BU talk to us about that paper that um, was presented or at least uh, offered as a comment being on the last tip uh, regarding mortality and and um, active transportation, how active transportation can re reduce that and some implications um, regarding the transportation climate initiative. So uh, he's agreed to come and talk with us. I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm deep teasing it because I, I think members of the board were, uh, would benefit from participating or at least watching a video that wouldn't happen. So thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Very interesting. Next up is the approval of the MPO minutes from March 18th. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the minutes and please state your name for the record. Uh, Eric Barasa. Good morning, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Tina Cassidy. And I'm happy to second that motion. Thank you, motion having been made and seconded, Jonathan, please call the roll. David Moeller. Yes. Marie Rose. Yes. John Romano? Yes. Jillian Linnell? Yes. Eric Barassa? Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane? Brian Kane, yes. Leonard Diggins? Leonard Diggins, yes. Tom Kadzis? Kansas, yes. Jim Fitzgerald? All right, yes. Jay Monty? Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis? David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz? Daniel Amstutz, yes. Todd Corain. Todd Corain, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Patrick Kieser. Patrick Kieser votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Tina Cassidy. Tina Cassidy votes yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer. Oh, I, I think you muted yourself. Apologies. Jennifer Constable, yes. Thank you. Uh, Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. Thank you. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke. Uh, looks like he may have just had a connection issue and dropped out. Okay. Um, otherwise, the motion will carry, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Next item on the agenda is the action item for the fiscal year 2021-2025 Transportation Improvement Program, Amendment Number Six, matching out. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Just a second here. Uh, so I'm here today to discuss Amendment 6 to the uh, Federal Fiscal Years 21 through 25 Transportation Improvement Program. Amendment 6 involves changes to both the highway and transit sections of the TIP, 
the full details of which are available in a handout posted to the MPO meeting calendar for your review. Uh, beginning with the highway changes, which are outlined on this slide, two state prioritized bridge replacement projects have seen cost increases in federal fiscal year 2021, uh, both of which are proposed to be addressed using remaining funds from other projects that have been closed out in 2021. These projects are number 608079 on Masquanica Street in Sharon and number 608637 on Florida Road in Maynard. Amendment 6 also updates the project description for number 606528 on Interstate 93 in Somerville. This project has been reclassified as a bridge preservation project as opposed to its original designation as a bridge reconstruction project. On the transit side of things, Amendment 6 programs state matching funds in federal fiscal year 2021 alongside expiring 2018 federal funds for a facility renovation project for the Cape Ann Transportation Authority. This project proposes to spend roughly $65,000 to replace 10,000 square feet of carpeting at CADA's administration and operations facility. Amendment 6 also includes changes across the MBTA's federal capital program. Much like was discussed last week for the MPO funded projects in Amendment 5, Amendment 6 aligns the MBTA's current fiscal years 2021 through 25 funding with the agency's proposed fiscal years 22 through 26 program. The table you see on the screen here, which is also available in the online handout, shows the adjustments made to each of the MBTA's programs across fiscal years. Federal fiscal year 2021 was adjusted to match the projects the MBTA expects to advance this year using federal funds, which is largely determined by project readiness. From there, fiscal years 2022 through 25 have been adjusted based on expected funding availability and anticipated allocations. These numbers may continue to be adjusted as part of the annual CIP process. Many of the specifics on individual projects and programs were discussed last week by Jillian Winnell in a presentation on the MBTA's proposed fiscal years 22 through 26 TIP programming. The changes in Amendment 6 allow the MBTA to continue to move forward with that proposed plan while addressing any cost or schedule changes for projects programmed in fiscal 2021. An affirmative vote on the amendment today will release it for a 21 day public review period. This review period will align with the anticipated comment period for the draft federal fiscal years 22 through 26 TIP uh, beginning on uh, next Monday, May 10th and concluding on May 31st. This puts amendment six on track for an endorsement vote at the June 3rd MPO meeting. That's all I have in Amendment 6, so I'll turn it back over to the chair for questions and a vote. Thank you, Matt. Questions? Brian Kane, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to note that um, the, the funds for the CADA rug replacement would also be well spent in the CTPS offices and wanted to ask you or if, if there was a way that we could find a way to get these poor folks a rug that is not uh, older than me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, actually, Brian, strangely, the answer is yes. So MassDOT, as, as I think everybody here knows, MassDOT owns that owns our building. And we are in the process of doing redesigns and repairs related to the future of work, part of which will involve uh, improvements to the CPS suite. And I am 99.9% .9 sure that includes getting a new carpet. You are a gentleman and a scholar, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to release this for a 21 day public review as presented today? Eric Barasa. Eric Barasa, I'll make a motion to release this tip amendment for public review. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz seconds. Thank you. Motion having been made and seconded, Brian. I mean, Brian. Which have made in second, Jonathan? Please call the roll. David Moeller. Yes. Marie Rose. Yes. John Romano. <clears throat> John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane. Uh, I'll be happy to call the roll for you, David. Brian Kane. <laughs> Uh, Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Tom Kadzis. Kadzis, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Gerald, yes. Jay Monty. 
Jay Monte, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Todd Corain. Todd Corain, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Patrick Keezer. Patrick Keezer votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Tina Cassidy. Tina Cassidy is yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer Constable, yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries unanimous, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Next item on the agenda is the release of the 2022-2026 TIP matching over. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for my second presentation today, uh, I'll present a short summary of the proposed federal fiscal years 2022 through 26 TIP before this board considers a vote to release the draft plan for a 21 day, <clears throat> excuse me, public review period. Here's the ground that we'll cover in the coming slides. I'll start with our main goal for today before offering a quick refresher on where we are in the overall TIP development timeline for the year. I'll then provide a short overview of this year's draft programming and the key decisions that were made in the creation of this TIP. From there, we'll wrap up with a few notes on next steps before moving to a discussion and vote. Uh, briefly, the main goal again for today is for this board to consider a vote to release the draft TIP for a 21-day public review period. In terms of the TIP process as a whole, this vote represents the last action that needs to be taken by this board before a final vote for endorsement. The final vote is anticipated to take place at the MPO meeting on June 3rd, at which time we'll also consider any public comments submitted during the review period. Before we move to a vote, I'd like to take a minute to briefly remind everyone of the overall process that led us to today, as well as the proposed programming contained in the draft tip. And even before we do that, I do wanna use this as an opportunity to say thank you to all of the MPO staff who played a role in producing the draft report that's available for your review on the MPO's website. As I'll always emphasize, uh, the TIP process is very much one that takes a village to accomplish, and the drafting of the report is certainly no exception. Our entire graphics team was involved in this process, an effort led by Kate Parker O'Toole, with additional support provided by Jane Gillis, Kim DeLore, and Ken Dumas. Editing of the whole draft was led by Maureen Kelly. In addition to these efforts, several other staff members led the development of the report's contents including Michelle Scott, Anne McGann, Betsy Harvey, and Matt Archer. Content review, guidance, and overall moral support was provided by Jonathan Church and Annette Demsher. Again, I can't say, say thank you enough to everyone uh, for all their support throughout this process uh, and their help in getting us to where we are today, which is very close to the end of the TIP process. With that, let's dive into a quick recap of where we landed this year. For the federal fiscal years 22 through 26 TIP, 31 projects were considered for funding across five of the MPO's investment programs, with the vast majority of projects distri distributed between the Complete Streets and Community Connections programs. This board elected to allocate funding to new projects solely within the Community Connections program. Nine of these projects are newly programmed, while the 10th was programmed last year, but allocated a second and third year of funding through this TIP. I'll come back to these projects in just a minute. So though it's not included in the 22 through 26 TIP, this year's TIP process led to the allocation of $14.8 million in funding to phase two of the Columbus Avenue bus lane project, uh, which has been programmed in federal fiscal year 2021. This project will allow the center running bus lanes that are currently being constructed, constructed along Columbus Avenue in Boston to instead extend north, north to Ruggles Station. Also included in the draft TIP is the allocation of $77 million in new funding to already program projects due to cost increases for these projects. In total, 18 projects had cost increases this year of greater than $500,000 or 20% of project costs. Finally, seven projects were delayed due to a combination of project readiness and cost increase issues, while two other projects were moved into earlier years. 
No other new projects were added to the TIP this year. Here's a snapshot of the final overall funding picture. Uh, this board elected to allocate nearly all of its available funding in fiscal years 22 through 25, while leaving more than $20 million unprogrammed in the fifth and final year of the TIP. The use of these funds will be explored in future TIP cycles. Coming back to the 10 projects proposed for new funding this year, again, all of these projects were funded through the MPO's Community Connections Program, with funding primarily allocated in fiscal year 2022. Two shuttle operations projects in Newton and Canton have funding allocated to them in subsequent years. As a reminder, these additional years of funding are tentatively allocated as the funds will only be awarded to the projects if they can demonstrate a successful reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as a result of their first year of operations. This is a condition of the federal congestion mitigation and air quality funding, uh, which is being used to support this program. Relative to the funding goals set in the long range plan, there are some slight disparities across investment programs. Complete streets and intersection improvements are slightly underfunded, while major infrastructure and bicycle and pedestrian projects are somewhat overfunded. The transit modernization program is still being established, which explains the funding discrepancy here, while community connections is more or less on target over five years. Roughly 4% of overall funding remains unallocated to any specific project or program. One other lens through which to view the draft tip is the distribution of funding across the region relative to the percentage of population, jobs, and roadway miles within each subregion. The one aspect of this uh, that may jump out to you is the relative lack of funding to Metro West. There are three projects in the draft tip in Metro West, but all three are relatively inexpensive at $3 million or less. Metro West does have a higher cost project uh, in fiscal year 2021, which is the reconstruction of Union Avenue in Framingham. Uh, but because that project is now out of the five-year TIP window, uh, you get the disparity on the screen in front of you. Uh, again, there's roughly $20 million in funding that remains unallocated to any specific project or program. Uh, so those funds do not appear in this chart, uh, but will in future iterations of the TIP uh, when those are allocated. Uh, in, addition, in addition to everything that was just discussed, the draft TIP also reflects several other key decisions. Uh, outlined in detail in chapter three of the report are the federal capital programs for the MPO's partner agencies in the region. This includes the draft federal highway program submitted by MassDOT, as well as the draft federal transit programs for the MBTA, MWRTA, and CADA. The processes for drafting each of these proposals uh, have been discussed at MPO meetings over the last several weeks by staff from each agency. And again, additional information on all of these projects and programs is available through, uh, throughout chapter three of the report. The draft TIP also includes several mentions of the recently established TIP policy subcommittee. This committee is made up of nine MPO members and is intended to provide a forum for in-depth discussions on how the MPO can and should address the issue of project cost increases in future TIP cycles. The committee will conduct its work throughout the summer with any recommended policy changes taking effect prior to the federal fiscal years 23 through 27 TIP cycle beginning this fall. Before wrapping up, uh, I wanna briefly highlight where we go from here. Assuming a positive vote this morning, the intent is to begin the public review period for the draft tip this coming Monday. As I noted earlier, that puts us on track for a final vote for endorsement at the MPO meeting on June 3rd. Looking ahead to the summer, we anticipate the tip policy subcommittee uh, to begin meeting within the next month or so. These meetings will continue into the late summer or early fall, at which point the committee will bring recommendations to the full board for consideration. We'll continue to provide updates to the board as this process moves along. And with that, that's all I have. So I'll turn it back over to the chair for a discussion and a vote. Thank you, Matt. Any questions for Matt? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to release the tip for a 21 day public review process? And please state your name for the record when making the motion. Eric Barasa. This is Eric Barassa, and I make a motion to um, approve the tip for a public comment period. Tom Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tom Kansas, City of Austin. Second that motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Jonathan, please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. Marie Rose. Marie Rose, yes. 
John Romano. John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane. Brian Kane, yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Tom Kazis. Tom Kazis, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Todd Corain. Todd Corain, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Patrick Kieser. Patrick Kieser votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Tina Cassidy. Tina Cassidy votes yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer Constable, yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries unanimous, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Next item on the agenda is a work program for the MBTA 2022 National Transit Database. Bradley Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to present a work program for MBTA State Fiscal Year 2022 National Transit Database. Uh, CTVS has been assisting the MBTA with their uh, annual submission to National Transit Database for many years. And this scope represents a continuation of that work. Uh, the cost of this project is $127,000 and the MBTA will pay for this project. Uh, the schedule for the project is 18 months, which will be July of 2021 until December of 2022. And the purpose of this project is to collect and analyze data for the MBTA about transit ridership in order to help the MBTA to make their annual required submission to the National Transit Database. There are many components to this project. Uh, one is to survey passengers at heavy and light rail stations in order to determine passenger trip lengths and as well as link trip factors, which is how often passengers transfer from heavy rail to heavy rail or from heavy rail to light rail, for example. Another component of this project is to uh, take samples of fare gate and fare box non-interaction, which is how often people enter the MBTA system without using a Charlie card or Charlie ticket. And that can happen for any of a number of reasons. Uh, for example, children enter the system for free under age 12. Occasionally an MBTA employee will let people in if they're having trouble with their Charlie card. And sometimes people will evade fare. Uh, and so we do surveys to, we, we do observations at fare gates and, at, uh, and on board light rail vehicles to observe non-interaction. Another component of this project is verification of the MBTA's automated passenger counters on board their bus modes, which is the motor buses, trackless trolley, and the silver line. Another component of this project is full route ride checks on the MBTA's purchase service bus routes that do not have automated passenger counters. And those are bus routes 714 and 716. Uh, another component of this project is to collect data to estimate ridership on substitute shuttle bus service that replaces segments of the rail rapid transit system that are uh, temporarily um, being uh, not in service for maintenance. Uh, so a note about COVID-19, uh, most NTD data collection was not possible for most of state fiscal year 2021 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in the last month or so, CTPS has been able to ramp up data collection for National Transit Database, and we anticipate being able to do more data collection in state fiscal year 2022 than we will have finished it by the end of state fiscal year 2021. And uh, nevertheless, there is a line in the scope that says that CTPS will continue to work with the MBTA to modify our sampling plans as needed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and I would like to request that the board please vote to approve this scope. Thank you. Any questions? Brian King. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. Putnam for the presentation. I really appreciate it. A um, couple of questions. So with respect to methodology, uh, have you considered using cell phone counters on 
the 714, 716, Mattapan, Green Line Surface, things like that where there aren't traditional AFC gates. What do you mean by cell phone counters? Well, technology exists. They use it in nightclubs to use uh, check the number of cell phone signals on a particular in a particular place at a particular time, and you can count them to determine how many people are there. Uh, we have not. I'd be happy to talk more about that uh, offline. Uh, I know one consideration with that approach is not all riders carry cell phones. And some uh, carry too. So yeah, I get you. Right. Um, it's been knocked around for a long time. Um, I guess my second question is, and, and this is more of a request, I think. Uh, you know, when I, when I worked at the T a while ago, um, the T gets slapped around a lot based on NTD data from various publications and various think tanks. When I was there, we tried to sort of get a, a map almost of how NTD data is collected and who does it. And so I guess my, my request to you would be, as you're going through this process, if you could just sort of keep track about sort of where you get what and who you get it from. And if that could somehow be included as, as an appendix or, or even just a handwritten piece of paper, I know it would go over and, and be particularly helpful to many people at the T who sort of have to deal with a, the NTD data once it's published. Thanks very yeah, much. No, no, thank you, Brian, for mentioning that. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to talk about that more as well. Uh, but as, as I'm sure you know, the component the CTPS works on is the service consumed aspect of the NTD report, which is how many trips were taken and how many miles were traveled by the passengers on the various components, right. uh, on the various modes. And that's just one of many components that go into the MBTA's annual report. Um, and other members of MBTA staff can speak to other components of the NTD submission. Great. Thank you very much. Speaking with Jillian O'Neill, you want to comment on something? <laughs> Happy to. Um, Brian, the comment is well received. Agreed. Um, to Bradley's point, there are a number of us that touch the different elements that get submitted annually through NTD. We are making a more conscious effort to actually document the processes involved in that so that we are coordinating better and we will take that feedback back. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Putnam. I mean, I really appreciate to your attendance at the Capital Investment um, and Finance Subcommittee meetings of the Rider Oversight Committee. And this is kind of along the lines of um, Brian's question. Uh, the camera technology for counting, I mean, um, did your client, Mr. Guptel, um, discuss that with you at all? Uh, I haven't spoken about it recently with Rob. I can bring it up with him. Um, we, we've looked into trying to use cameras. Um, my personal experience was it was difficult. Um, we, we were able to use some camera footage for trying to observe non-interactive fare gates, but it's, it's hard to see on a camera. It, even though the camera picture is much higher quality than it once was, it, it, in my finding was it was, it, it's hard to replace an actual human being with actual eyes in the station seeing what's going on. Uh, but we'd be happy to look into how that could be used in some, in either fare gates or on buses. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to approve this work scope as presented today? And please state your name for the record when making the motion. Brian Kane. Brian Kane uh, moves to approve as presented. Eric Barasa. I second that. Thank you. David, I think you're muted. Yeah, I didn't even touch it, but I was. <laughs> Jonathan, please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. Marie Rose. Yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane. Brian Kane, yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Tom Kadzis. Tom Kadzis, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. 
David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Todd Corain. Todd Corain, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Thatcher Keezer. Thatcher Keezer votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Tina Cassidy. Tina Cassidy votes yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer Constable, yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries unanimous, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. As most mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to change our agenda now and take up the update to Metro Common next. Eric, do you want to tee it up or should we just go directly to the presentation? Uh, hi, good morning. Can you hear me? I think I'm going to actually get us started. Yep, we can hear you, Emily, whenever you're ready. Great. This is Emily Torres Cullinane, um, co director of strategic initiatives at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. I oversee the community engagement division, the subregions, and I am one of the um, people on the team for Metro Common. So we don't have a presentation for you today, but I do have. Um, the website that I was going to use as a backdrop um, as I talked a little bit about our Metro Common update. So I'm going to go ahead and hit um, share screen and I think I can bring you to the main page of our Metro Common website. So if you have not visited it yet, um, please, uh, you can take a chance. All the information is there that I'm going to be speaking about. It's metrocommon.mapc. Dot org. So a few months ago, I believe at the beginning of the year, Sarah Philbrick, um, uh, one of our researchers, presented on Metro Common. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what has happened since January, tell you where we are in the process. I will pop on the screen, sort of reminder of what our goals are, talk about our action areas and our recommendations. Um, and then Eric can talk a little bit more about the transportation related recommendations. Uh, and then we will be joined um, as well um, by Anne McGann, who will talk about the long range transportation plan and how sort of that connects and links. Uh, so uh, a few months ago, um, at the beginning of the year, uh, we really sort of wrapped up the work that Sarah was doing um, around looking at different futures. Uh, we started our process of drafting recommendations, policy recommendations to reach the goals. There's about 10 goals and I can actually pop them up on the screen here um, as a reminder. Uh, so getting around, homes for everyone, uh, goals around a climate and resilient region, having a net zero carbon region, having dynamic and representative government, uh, healthy environment, economic security, economic prosperity, healthy and safe neighborhoods, and a thriving arts, culture, and heritage in our region. Um, and so that is uh, the goals that we have as part of our Metro Common process. And then in the last few months, what we did is we organized the goals into five areas of action. Um, I don't know if you remember Metro Future, but Metro Future had 65 goals and many, many, many sort of strategies. So we really tried to simplify this time and, and get it down to these um, er five areas of action. Uh, and then after um, we did sort of really mm, identified the problem statement and sort of the challenges and sort of the systems related to uh, metropolitan area Planning Council, the Metro Common Plan, uh, we came up with these, um, I think there's about 19 areas of strategy to meet these goals. And so I'm just gonna sort of put pop them on the screen so you can see here, get a general sense. There's a strategy and action areas under each um, area. When you have a moment, if you could please go through, um, I'll just kind of 
um, uh, point one out here, improved transportation accessibility and regional connectivity. Um, each one has a, a document that's related. And again, these are our draft recommendations. Um, and so what I wanted to uh, sort of have everyone know is that this month, we are looking for your comments and your feedback on these strategies and um, actions uh, through a survey. So again, if you go back to the main uh, website, um, right here very easily um, is our policy survey. All of the 19 policies are here. You can click on it, um, very easy to use, and um, all of our policies are listed. Um, so you can you know, run through the ones that you're most interested in, um, or you can take some time and really sort of give us feedback on, on the whole the whole thing. So uh, that is um, pretty much the, what I wanted to present to give you a sense of where we are at. Um, for the last three months, we have been meeting with um, experts in the field around these recommendations and doing focus groups. Um, and uh, we feel that, you know, they're now sort of ready for the public um, to look at and to, to give us feedback. So I'm going to stop sharing here and then pass it on to Eric Barasa for more details. Yeah, th thank you, Emily. Um, and so uh, all of these policy recommendations that cut across all of those different topic areas that um, Emily just, just touched on, we're very much interested in getting feedback on all of them. I mean, they they touch, you know, for, for many of our municipal officials, they touch on all things that, you know, you all work on. Um, love to have feedback. Uh, you know, the, the, the process over the next really like month or so is to gather as much feedback as we can. And then we're going to look to, um, you know, take that feedback, make changes, augment any of these recommendations, right, Emily? And then we want to kind of final, finalize them towards the end of the summer, early fall. So uh, many of the recommendations are, um, you know, geared towards our cities and towns, some of them to our state agencies, some of them towards the private sector. Um, I've been workshopping a few of these recommendations with various um, staff and in, in, some at MassDOT, some at MBTA, um, but really is our, our, is our opportunity now to get more kind of feedback as we're looking to um, work towards the, the summer to, to finalize these. Um, some of you might remember with Metro Future, we had um, very specific recommendations around you know, infrastructure projects and things like that. We're trying to keep it a little higher level and we're also trying to not um, necessarily cover every single issue, but things that we think are really important things um, kind of for like the next 10 years on how we get, um, how we move some, some things forward and get, get more towards that 2050 year vision. So I'll stop at this point. And, um, and as Emily said, uh, really encourage people to, to take the survey if, if you have time. Thanks, Eric. Questions from members for either Emily or Eric? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to make oh, sure, sorry, Anne, I'm sorry, Ann McGann was going to <laughs> also, I think, plant a seed now for the long range transportation plan and I, it's coming sooner than you think. Um, so, Anne, are you there? Um, yes, I am. Thanks. Thank you, Amelia. You, you said that at the beginning and I totally forgot. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Thanks. So thanks, Emily and Eric, for the update on Metro Common. So what I want to do is a quick update on how Metro Common will fit into the development of our next long range plan, which we're calling uh, Destination 2050. So the new LRTP will extend the current horizon year from 2040 to 2050 and will cover the same time frame as Metro Common. And just as a note, um, our new LRTP will have to be adopted in spring of 2023. So for coordination uh, with MAPC on Metro Common, uh, when MPO staff is updating the LRTP goals and objectives, we'll review Metro Common's goals for those that pertain to our transportation planning process and identify ways to coordinate the goals. Uh, for example, Metro Commons transportation goal is that traveling around Metro Boston is safe, affordable, convenient, and enjoyable with some objectives of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure is safe, extensive, high quality, and linked to other modes. 
and the transportation system is designed and operated to ensure access to opportunity for everyone with a particular emphasis on neighborhoods historically underserved by high quality transit. So this goal has elements of our current safety, capacity management and equity goals. So staff will do a complete review of all the MPO's current goals along with Metro Common goals. And uh, we'll also look at Metro Common's policy recommendations and identify opportunities for coordination with MAPC to implement policy, policies from both Metro Common and those that we establish in the new LRTP. So for our scenario planning process, um, we will also coordinate with MAPC on the scenarios that were done as part of the development of uh, Metro Common. As Emily mentioned, uh, Sarah Pillsbury um, presented information on the Metro Common scenarios at your MPO meeting in February of this year. And at that meeting, she talked about um, some key uncertainties, including regional demographics and the economy and the future of travel. Uh, we'll, we'll work with MAPC on demographic projections as needed for scenarios that the MPO will prioritize as part of Destination 2050. And we'll also work with MAPC, MassDOT, and the other MPOs in the state to develop the final demographic projections for 2050 that will be used in the adopted plan. So in addition to coordination with MAPC, I just wanna give you a quick update on other ongoing and upcoming activities on Destination 2050 development. Staff is now in the process of conducting the UPWP study and forming the big ideas for the MPO scenario planning. And we have just finished eight focus groups gathering input from the public on their ideas on what they think will be the driving forces that will shape our future transportation system. So this input will help to lay the groundwork for our scenario planning efforts as part of the next LRTP. So just to give you a few ideas um, for scenario planning that we're hearing from the public, um, they include looking at how more people working from home might affect the transportation system, transit expansion, especially electric buses, climate change and the resiliency of the transportation system, and what the population housing and employment might look like in the future. So Kate White um, will be summarizing this information and present it to you in the next few months. Um, and using that inf information, the MPO uh, can develop a prioritized list of scenarios that staff will analyze to help you establish recommendations in the new LRTP. So then we'll work with the modeling group to start our model runs. And uh, Marty Milkovitz from our staff presented information last week about the travel demand model and the tools that can be used in our scenario planning process. And information from the scenario planning process can then help you uh, while making the policy decisions for destination 2050. And if all goes well, uh, we hope to start the first scenario this fall. We're also beginning to update the needs assessment, looking at the existing and future transportation needs in the region. And this information will help us to make revisions as needed to the MPO's vision goals and objectives. And we're also in the process of developing a new web page for the LRTP and the needs assessment, which will include information on the destination 2050 development process, as well as the outreach information on the plan as it becomes available. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. Thanks, Ann. Questions from any member? Seeing none, look for, oh wait, Brian Key. Uh, thanks, David. I just a question for maybe for you or for the for the whole group. Um, can someone draw the map for me of how Metro Commons, the LRTP, Destination 2050, the PMT, the CIP, and the STIP all all relate? And you want to try to draw that map? So basically, as we do our, our long range plan, we review all of these documents. And as I said, you know, we're going to be reviewing Metro Common for their goals, uh, their policies, and we can, we'll do the same for all of these other uh, plans that are out there. So, and, and for scenario planning, we'll be looking at information from all of these documents to, to bring to you to help, to help us decide which scenarios we want to look at for the future. Okay, so that there's no real hierarchy then of, of, of these things, but they're all related to each other. Is that fair to say? Thank you. Eric, you want to add something? 
Yeah, and, and Brian, thank you. I think that's a, that's honestly a, a great question, and I think um, I think that for you know MABC for our regional plan, um, and and certainly for our policy recommendations, they're they're definitely distinctively MAPC and not you know and not the MPOs um, policy recommendations. The 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 planning and then the sort of the demographic work that we do when it comes to the land use that then flows directly into um, the long range plan and ultimately then the, then, then the modeling and sort of becomes the base of sort of land use assumptions that then go into the long range plan. And then when we model actually like the long range plan and we want to try to estimate like, well, what is the future mean for um, trips and traffic and crashes and, you know, things like that, like that we're using, you know, that land use as sort of the base for, for trip generation and, and things like that. Um, obviously, we work, you know, tremendously close with 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 MassDOT, with the MBTA, with the staff to try to get on the same page. I think um, I think your question about like sort of the PMT is a good one too, which the most recent iteration of it is the the Focus Forty, you know, document. And and again, I think the more those documents can be specific. Um, the better we can it can kind of try to we try to feed it into the the long range long range plan process. One of the tensions we have with the, with the MPO long range plan, and I think this is, you know, a topic for discussion as we move forward is because it is such a fisc, you know, because of this requirement for it to be a fiscally constrained document, it's, it's really challenging to say like, well, 25 years from now, what are we like, how are we, how are we cost estimating a project and programming it and things like that? I, I think like, you know, it's like sort of the, to me, and this is a big conversation we've had at MAPC. It's like, the next 10 years is really like the really like an, an important period to be getting right and like really focusing with with the idea that like you know we want to sort of be aiming for what's the what's 20 25 years from now but really the next 10 years is how how are we lining things up getting things in place to then kind of have that more um you know illustrative um you know what's going to happen in kind of 20 or 25 years but um, yeah, we, we want to, you know, we want to connect those dots as much as we can. But thank you for that question. And, and can I just add, getting back to the demographics, um, that process is going to be starting up now that the new census data is out. And we work with, there's a statewide demographic committee with all the MPOs and MassDOT. Um, and we, we work through that process, um, come up with a control total for the state and then what each um, MPO has a control total that they're given, and then it, it would be up to the MPO and MAPC to actually allocate that control total for the Boston MPO over the 97 communities in our region. So that process will be beginning this summer, um, and they'll ultimately end up with our adopted land use that is included in the, in the travel model. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Next item on the agenda is the FY 2020 safety and operations analysis at selected intersections, Chen Wang Wang. When you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Yang Wang, uh, MPO staff of the uh, Traffic Analysis and Design Group. Uh, this study uh, is a biennial study that we have been conducted in the past 10 years. And uh, it grew uh, out of from the recommendation of the MPO's uh, congestion management process to support uh, city and towns and uh, MESTA in addressing safety and operational uh, problems at concerned locations. Past study has been well received because uh, they provided uh, uh, potential low cost improvement and a head start for the functional design. In this latest round, we review about 30 uh, 
locations and uh, select Route 27 at the West Street in Matthew and the Adam Street at Furnace Brook Parkway and the Common Street in Quincy for study. First, let's look at the Matthew uh, location. The intersection is synchronized, connect two major roadway. North Meadow Road is the part of uh, Route 27, a state highway running uh, from uh, Kingston all the way to Chanceford. In this section, it carry about 10,000 vehicles per day. West Street is a uh, urban minor arterial owned by the town, carry about 6,000 vehicles per day. At that intersection, there are no crosswalk, no sidewalk, and no dedicated bike lane. Adjacent land use, including commercial and uh, industrial uh, development, uh, shops and offices, a daycare, a pre-childhood school, and an, an ongoing housing project at the American Legion site. Uh, Matt, uh, if you can take over, it seems like my computer. Thank you. So, uh, next we will use a short film to show the existing condition. This is first time we use a video through Zoom. Hope it goes well. Uh, mm -hmm. The video was taken about a week before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, state emergency. Next. So coming from uh, downtown area, Route 27 is quite wide, under 45 miles speed limit control. And the uh, one lane shared by all movement near the intersection. And southbound is also under 45 miles uh, speed limit and toward the intersection. It is also has one lane without dedicated turning lane. West Street eastbound is one lane. The signal is not located in the center and hard to see. Westbound on West Street um, can under sun glare in the afternoon. Again, signal is hard to see. And especially on the uh, Route 27, that signal is especially uh, appear to be small. And the intersection has large layout and wide turning radii. And no crosswalk or sidewalk at the intersection. And the high travel speed and the frequently uh, yellow light and red light running at the intersection. And West Street is, is congested uh, in the morning, inbound and in the out, afternoon, outbound. Next. The major concern of this intersection is the high crash and the high uh, severity. Uh, it's rank, uh, a top 200 uh, uh, stay uh, uh, crash site uh, based on 2014 to 16 data, and almost half of the uh, crashes caused injury. Further analysis indicate that a large portion of the crashes are caused by red light running. Our analysis found that uh, high approaching speed, inadequate uh, intersection geometry, and the insufficient signal display, and also the setting of yellow and the old red clearance time. These are all contribute to the unsafe condition at this intersection. Next. In total, there were about 50 crashes occur at this location. Next. 
and uh, about 21 crashes are angle collision, right angle collision that caused by a red light running vehicle and all cause personal injuries. Next. Additionally, uh, several angle crashes caused by a left turn vehicle. This is because lack of the dedicated turning lane at this location. Next. So uh, based on our analysis, we uh, develop a series of short-term and long-term improvement. The short-term improvement mainly are signage and uh, payment marking improvement. Uh, and uh, also uh, proposed to uh, adjust the yellow and the uh, red clearance interval at this intersection and uh, consider the change of the speed limit from 45 to 40 miles per hour. But this have to, uh, based on MESTAR's requirement, this have to conduct a little bit further uh, study for this propose, proposal. And the Route 27 appeared to be wide enough to install bike then with traffic buffer. Next. In the long term, we have three uh, uh, alternatives. The first and second alternative is to reconstruct the intersection with two different uh, uh, left turn operation. The first is to have the protected only left turn. The second is to provide protected and permissive uh, left turn on all approach. The third one is a modern roundabout option. Next. The alternative one uh, proposed to uh, install dedicated left turn lane on all approaches. And alternative one and two will have the similar layout, except alternative one will require about one or two additional left turn storage. In the meantime, we propose to install sidewalk and crosswalk uh, on all approaches and uh, to install a uh, uh, separate bike lane with traffic buffer on Route 27 and the Mac West and the Mac uh, West Street, a uh, share bike road. Next. Alternative three proposed to uh, convert the intersection into a single lane roundabout with uh, inscribed circle of about 130 foot in diameter in diameter and the uh, of course of uh, install a crosswalk and the sidewalk on all approaches and uh, install 10 foot multi-use pass and circled in the uh, roundabout this is based on the most recent just published last summer Mesta uh, roundabout uh, design guide that uh, would provide uh, people biking the option to circle in the roundabout with the traffic or to use the multi-use pass to go around the roundabout to go where they like to go. Next. We also uh, conduct analysis of the proposed alternative under 2030 projected uh, traffic condition. And as uh, shown in this table, uh, all three alternatives will be operated at acceptable level of services. But more importantly, although not showing in this table, but showing in our analysis is that all these alternatives will significantly improve the safety of all users. Next. Uh, we uh, met with Mesta, District 3, and uh, the town of uh, Matthew in last September uh, to present and discuss uh, our fi findings and uh, recommendations both uh, short-term and long-term improvements were well received. 
And just recently, the town already started a design process and uh, they are uh, actively seeking uh, funding for the reconstruction of uh, this intersection. Next. Now uh, let's look at the uh, uh, Quincy intersections. Next. The Quincy location include two intersections uh, located uh, close to each other on Adam Street. Adam Street is a principal urban arterial, runs from uh, Quincy Center all the way to uh, East Milton. In this section, it carry about 18 uh, uh, vehicle per day on the east side and about 15, uh, 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 18 thousand vehicle per day east uh, west of the intersection but on the east east of the parkway intersection it carry about 15,000 vehicle per day and furnace brook parkway is a minor urban arterial it carry about 12,000 vehicles per day and it's owned by this year uh, running all the way from Blue Hill Reservation to Quincy Show uh, Reservation. Common Street is a town on, a city on uh, major character, carry about 6,000 vehicles per day, and it runs a parallel to the pathway from uh, the Southeast Expressway all the way to this area and the end at uh, Adam Street. And during uh, peak hour, uh, all the approach are very congested. Uh, the section of Aden Street between the two intersections, that means west of the uh, east of the parkway, is especially congested because traffic is allowed to uh, cross Adam Street from Common Street to turn left or to continue north on the uh, parkway. And uh, also there are a lot of pedestrian crossing at this location because there are many residential area and there's a commercial district uh, uh, west of this intersection uh, with the Adam Plaza stable of this uh, commercial uh, district and the primary school located about 500 feet just north of this uh, location. Next. Again, we use a short film to show the scene condition in this area. Uh, the video was taken uh, about two weeks before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Next. So Aden Street eastbound have two lanes, but no dedicated uh, left turn lane. And Adam Street westbound is especially wide uh, with three lanes. And uh, uh, Furnace Brew Parkway northbound has only one lane, southbound has only one lane. And this is uh, Common Street uh, looking from uh, Adam Street, looking toward Common Street. And the issue at this location is wide, very wide, uh, uh, Adam Street section. And uh, this create long crossing distance for people who walk and bike and the traffic congestion during peak hours. And uh, this is uh, the, the, the peak hour, the, 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 the looking toward the common street and a lot of cut through traffic and uh, this is the very congested area between the two intersections. And this is another angle, look at the unsafe crossing from Common Street to, uh, to the Furnace Brew Parkway northbound. And the uh, uh, school crossing guard, uh, guard guiding uh, people uh, in the morning and all the signal are post-mounted 
uh, have very poor uh, uh, visibility and the parking is uh, sort of unrelated, uh, unre unre uh, uh, regulated. Uh, next. So these are the issues uh, we just uh, saw uh, from the videos. And uh, the major issue is the safety of this intersection. The uh, park, parkway uh, uh, intersection is one of the top 5% uh, intersection in uh, crash location in the MPO. Uh, in addition to the uh, uh, the, the many uh, crashes happen at the uh, common street. Uh, they form a dense cluster of high crash location. Next. In total, there were 72 crashes at this uh, location in the past five years. And uh, the predominant uh, crash pattern is the angle collision involve a left turn a vehicle, many occur on the uh, Eden Street uh, uh, approaches. And uh, the main reason is the lack of the dedicated turning end on almost all the approach at the parkway intersection. And at the common street intersection, there's a series of crashes uh, involve a vehicle coming from common street crossing uh, Adam Street. And uh, in total, you can see that there were a series of about 17 uh, 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 crashes at this location. Next. So based on our analysis, uh, we propose a series of uh, uh, short-term improvement. This including retiming of the uh, uh, Park Street intersection under the existing signal setting and uh, a series of uh, signage and uh, payment marking improvement to raise drivers awareness and to improve the operation in this area. Next. In long term, we have four uh, alternatives. Uh, alternative one to three is to reconstruct both intersection and the upgrade the signals and to uh, with uh, three different uh, uh, operation at the uh, uh, common street. The last alternative is to uh, convert the intersection into the uh, into a double lane roundabout. Next, uh, alternative one proposed to. Uh, uh, reconstruct both intersection and reduce the large layout by removing the northbound uh, right turn uh, uh, channelization and uh, reduce the width, width of uh, Adam Street and uh, 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 upgrade completely overhaul the uh, signal system at the uh, park, parkway and that would uh, include the uh, accessible uh, uh, pedestrian signal, uh, bicycle detection, and uh, new uh, signal heads. At the common street, uh, 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 we propose to maintain the existing operation, but uh, to uh, strength, strengthen the uh, 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 like the do not block area and the other uh, short term with that uh, those proposed for the short term improvement. And uh, of course, aiding the uh, uh, bike then on uh, both Adam Street and the uh, Furnace Brew Parkway and the uh, the uh, reduce the crossing distance uh, based on the uh, rearrangement of the, the area. Next. Alternative two would include all the elements that we propose for alternative one, but to synchronize that uh, common street intersection and both signal will be under a single a signal controller. 
uh, with this uh, 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 proposal uh, that uh, signal would run at the protected only left turn operation and the pedestrian would run in the uh, concurrent mode. Next. Alternative three proposed to uh, 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 to uh, install a race uh, traffic median and uh, to uh, prohibit uh, traffic from Common Street crossing Adam Street. As a result, the uh, the right turn channelization can be removed and uh, the area can become a comfortable. Uh, walking area uh, for people. Next. Uh, alternative four is the uh, uh, a modern roundabout ocean. Uh, single analysis indicate that uh, uh, it would require double end roundabout in order to walk, uh, uh, make this uh, uh, roundabout walking. And uh, it also require a uh, inscribed circle of at least 165 feet in diameter. And uh, uh, we propose to uh, install a crosswalk on all approaches. And uh, again, uh, 10 foot uh, multi-use uh, 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 path uh, encircling the uh, roundabout uh, for the uh, uh, share use by uh, people who walk and bike. This alternative would uh, require a much larger uh, uh, layout, uh, but it would significantly improve the safety for all users. Next. Uh, this table uh, show uh, an overall review of that uh, those alternative uh, uh, under the 2030 uh, traffic conditions. And uh, uh, again, uh, they would operate it at a simple, uh, acceptable uh, level of service. And uh, again, although not showing in this table, but uh, uh, in our analysis that uh, the safety of uh, the users of this uh, area will be significantly improved. Next. We met with the, the city and the Mesta in early, earlier this year in February. And the, uh, the city uh, favors uh, alternative two and the alternative four. Alternative two is to synchronize the common street in the section under one controller. Alternative four is the uh, roundabout option. And they plan to uh, work with the DCR to advance the design process. Uh, next. Uh, this is uh, it. Uh, thank you. And uh, questions and the comments. Thank you. Any questions from the members? Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so let me just pop over to another screen here. Um, so um, here yeah, I am. Um, I saw that you had follow up with um, Quincy, and, and I thought that was a very good letter that they submitted. Did you follow up with folks from Metfield? Oh yes. Uh, I think I mentioned that actually um, Metfield uh, intersection it, has been go along very well. Yeah, that's right. You did. You did. I'm sorry I interrupted. Yeah, yeah I, I remember you saying you did. I just yeah. I was remembering that I forgot and just didn't see the letter and I was thinking that uh, you hadn't, but thank you for that reminder. Um, uh, and I, just, I, I interrupted just because I want to move through things quickly. Um, so, um, uh, oh, my request is that you know, the reports are very good. The memos are very good. You know, my only request is that uh, if you could, when you lay out the contents, if you could um, also add that there are appendices because I thought the information in the appendices were, were very, very interesting. You know, and and um, in particular, I found the police reports to be uh, of interest. And I noticed that on the police reports, there is no um, real information about, especially for pedestrian um, accidents. You know, 
No information on the pedestrian, like um, age, uh, gender, uh, race. Um, is that information just not on the reports or it wasn't provided with what you gave us? Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that information is actually in the police report, but uh, uh, usually in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the, the summary table, we try to make that, that most important information show up there. Gotcha. But that was the summary table, the, that, that major information of each, each uh, uh, crisis was summarized in the appendices. But uh, if you uh, want to have the uh, uh, detailed report, I have the hard copy of the detailed report in PDF file format. Well, well, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to ask for that now. I'll ask you, I'll tell you why I was asking about that, because I just wanted to see if maybe me some kind of equity issue me, might pop out me, if pedestrians are primarily of a certain age me, or, or a certain race. I mean, we might have me some other factor going on here that might make it more compelling that we deal um, with, with these issues. Um, or, or the safety and make, make, it, it can give us more reason to tell the municipal, municipal officials that you really need to work on this intersection because I mean, let's say you know people without cars are walking more I mean and then I mean, they are getting I mean, into these accidents then we could have a more incentive I me mean, to, to um, want to deal um, with them. And here's a general question is for you and maybe um, for the chair and the rest of the group it's like what kind of feedback would be helpful from us? for these memos I mean, um, when you present to us like what is it that you want from us uh, because I enjoy reading them I mean I, I will say the staff meet you know, uh you kind of broke me this time you know I didn't get to read it all uh, but I will uh, 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 and, and, uh, uh, but I want to read in a way that the feedback that I can give you will be of use for you so you don't have to answer that now but just think about it and give us some 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 insight as to uh, what would be helpful from us okay thank you very good work Thank you, uh, Mark Abbott, you have your hand raised. Do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, further some information about Lynn asking about the, the crash data. Is that some of that personal information, Lynn, is protected by HIPAA laws and um, it doesn't, some of it's not readily available on some of the reports that we get. So that's why um, we typically don't show that information. Yeah. And then as Thank to you. your other question about um, what we're looking for is not only we want to kind of affirm that we're doing a good job of work with the board, but um, we also like some of the board's input about, you know, other locations that we could look at, or, you know, if they have things that were missing, like you talked about some of the um, appendices, how we should um, make that more noticeable or maybe refer to it more in the reports and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, uh, I actually thank you, Nana, uh, because the uh, because I have too too much information to present. I forget to mention the pedestrian uh, 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 or uh, 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 accident involved a bicyclist. At the first intersection, the Matthew intersection, there were no pedestrian or bicycle uh, crashes. At the second intersection, we have two pedestrian. Uh, uh, crashes in the past five years, but uh, both of them occurred at the uh, very wide and the very congested uh, Adam Street section in between the two intersections. So uh, this information uh, give you uh, uh, some idea of that it mainly is caused by the operations of these two intersections. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, David. Um, good presentation, a lot of information. Um, I just wanted to say that what I like about, uh, about these studies is something that I really recommend the MPO adopted for the tip and that is video. Um, I think it's time for the MPO to, to introduce video in the evaluation process. That video that we just saw, it was, you know, it was, everything was condensed and you had to get a point across, but 
it provided me with a context. And it reminded me that it worked when, when people in the, the transportation department get a customer complaint. We go to Google and we, we look and we try to understand it. We try to bring the field into the desk. And I'd urge CTPS to reach out to, I know that the time to film things can be uh, expensive, it's staff time, but maybe the Google Street View, is my understanding is that, that you can subscribe to Google Street View uh, and for some, for some money, get features like creating routes and, and, and other things. Or you just, you just, you just we just you just rip it off it's, it's there it's there for the taking <laughs> but as far as the video you might need something with with google i it just occurred to me i, I brought it up before i'd really urge the mpo to look into it thanks mr chair thank you tom kim miller uh thank uh, thank you mr chair very good presentation Yan. um just a, 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 on the on the uh, quincy one um you, you mentioned that uh, DCR owns, uh, as Furnaceburg Parkway is obviously the DCR road, Adam Street is a city road, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, so in terms of um, implementing this, it, just looking at Google Maps, it looks like that intersection where they just put in uh, sidewalks and uh, media, they just redid it. Um, just looking at uh, Google Maps, I don't know if uh, it just looks like everything, the sidewalks and everything are new. I don't know if that's true. But um, in terms of implementing, implementing, who would be responsible for implementing the short-term uh, improvements? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I will check the Google uh, map. Uh, uh, we, when we met with the, uh, the, uh, the, the city, uh, in this uh, February, uh, they did not mention about the new construction, and uh, that probably is already there for a while. Uh, so, uh, the uh, in terms of the <laughs> how that will be working, uh, you uh, it since it's a little bit complicated uh, because uh, the 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 city um, mentioned that uh, the they actually in the process uh, is talking with DCR. Yeah, uh, first uh, uh, you are right. The uh, the 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 signal at the parkway is owned by the DCR, and the intersection of uh, Adam Street and the Common Street is owned by the city. So the first thing is that you know the city have to work with uh, the DCR to get DCR to start it to get get uh, uh, to show them our report and to get the process. But more, more uh, I think the city is actually active try to seeking gain the uh, ownership of this intersection and the intersection of the parkway at the uh, Quarry Street and, uh, and uh, maybe a couple of other intersections. The city is in uh, actively working, try to gain the ownership of this uh, uh, intersection. I think the there are a couple of other locations like uh, the uh, the parkway at the uh, Hancock Street is actually owned by the city, so the city tried to uh, is is the city the city have been uh, this this location has been on the city's radar for a while, and the the the, the city really uh, appreciate our our uh, 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 report of this uh, alternative and uh, and uh, but the city is working on it <laughs> thank you right. uh, just uh, just another question i mean is uh, is there any thoughts that you because because in terms of um uh, some of the recommendations for at least for the uh intersection not the roundabout you could you could actually implement for example you could actually close that right turn uh that free right from Furnace Brook Parkway to Adam Street, you could actually close that just with striping and a barrier now. Um, it wouldn't really require probably significant reconstruction. And that that may be that some maybe there are some more extensive, let's call them short term. Uh, you can maybe get some elements of your recommendations of the alternatives and 
make them more of a short short term improvements. Thank you. Yeah, that that's a good thought. We 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 will pass that to the city uh, to see if they can uh, do some uh, 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 temporary uh, 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 restriping or other way to cross. You, you are right. The uh, the as you notice that there are three uh, right turn channel at the parkway intersection, and this is one. This is the one. It really doesn't need it. It has a much lower volume than the other two. Yeah, uh, we we will pass the suggestion to the city to see uh, it to include the the short term uh, improvement. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Chair. Next item on the agenda is the locations with high bike and pedestrian crashes or crash rates. Casey. Good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, like David just said, um, I'm Casey Claude. I'm presenting the locations with high bicycle and pedestrian crash rates in the Boston region MPO area. It's a long mouthful of a study, but um, hopefully I'll give you a good brief overview. Uh, next slide, Matt. Um, so just a quick, oh, um, the study purpose is uh, to examine the safety, mobility, and comfort issues for bicycle and pedestrian travel at intersections in the Boston region of PO. Uh, go on, next slide. Um, the objectives um, of the study are to study the high crash um, locations to better understand uh, what is contributing to the danger of walking and bicycling at selected intersections. And also the second is to identify features of the physical environment and need of improvement for the safety and comfort of pedestrian and bicycle travel. Um, this project began with the selection of study locations, after which we evaluated the selected intersections. Next slide. So the selection process was broken into four steps. We began by gathering and analyzing data, which then made it possible to prioritize locations. After the prioritization process, we evaluated the intersections for study suitability. For example, if we knew of existing work being done to improve an intersection, we did not consider the location for this study. Finally, we communicated with the municipalities where our selected locations um, or intersections were located. We wanted to ensure that the municipalities were interested in this work, that they would pursue implementation of our recommendations, and we wanted to learn from the, from the municipalities about the locations. Next slide. Uh, through the first step of our selection process, we identified 1,001 intersections within 30 MPO region municipalities. The process involved compiling all Highway Safety Improvement Program, or HSIP, eligible pedestrian and bicycle crash clusters within the region, and then identifying all of the intersections within those compiled crash clusters. We then determined the equivalent property damage only, or EPDO, of each intersection to identify the crash severity rating of each location. Finally, we analyzed the transportation analysis zones within which the intersections were located um, to identify whether they, they were areas that exceed the Boston MPO's regional thresholds for minority or low-income populations. This information was used to weight the priority of intersections within areas that include historically underserved populations. Next slide. So through this process, we identified three study locations. Uh, we uh, evaluated Everett Avenue and Chestnut Street in Chelsea, uh, Liberty Street and Washington Street in Lynn, and Main Street and Center Street in Malden. We reached out to the municipalities, and when there was the opportunity, we engaged with them to determine what work would be most beneficial. Next slide. Um, so the, each of the studies that we produce, each of the memos that we produced for the municipalities um, had these different components. So we documented the existing conditions, we identified issues and concerns, we graded the intersections using the pedestrian report card assessment and the bicycle report card, and we analyzed crashes, after which we recommended improvements. Today, I'll be presenting issues and concerns that we identified at each um, intersection location, and then I'll be sharing the conceptual designs that we recommended to the municipalities. Next slide. 
So first up is Chelsea. As I mentioned, that's Everett Avenue and Chestnut Street. Um, as you can see, there is a, a bus stop on the northeastern um, edge of this intersection location. Um, so that is a major uh, location, a driver for people walking and biking. Um, next slide. Uh, let me, oops, sorry. Um, so this is just a picture that I took of the intersection while visiting the location. Gives you a little bit of an idea of what it what it's like. Um, next slide. So the some issues and concerns that we identified when studying the location. Uh, first off was the lack of ADA compliant curb ramps at the location. Um, and then also there were fading or missing crosswalk markings. Uh, at the time, there weren't bicycle facilities. Uh, since then, since the time that we visited the location, Chelsea has added dedicated bike lanes and shero markings to Washington Avenue and Broadway from 6th Street to 3rd Street using MassDOT's shared streets and spaces funding. But that isn't technically in the intersection location. It's within the, within the area. So any recommendations we could provide through this study would help grow the bicycle network in Chelsea. Um, the, also, the width of the roadway of Everett Avenue contributed to confusion about the number of travel lanes and encouraged uh, drivers on Everett Avenue, vehicle lists, uh, people driving, to travel quickly throughout the vicinity of the intersection, in spite of the fact that vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians may be crossing or turning onto Everett Avenue. Um, there also is a fairly odd intersection geometry at this location, which was a, a major feature of what we, what we looked at and tried to address. Um, the part of that is created by the inaccessible intersection island, um, the lack of safe pedestrian accommodations on and leading to the pedestrian refuge island fails to communicate to motorists um, that they should expect people walking um, and biking in the roadway at this intersection. And finally, there were obstructed views of oncoming traffic, the on-street parking in the study area and overgrown vegetation on the pedestrian refu refuge island make it difficult for both motor people driving and people walking to see other roadway users traveling through the intersection. Okay, next slide. So this is the conceptual design that we proposed to, um, to Chelsea. We, uh, we suggested that they replace the apex curb ramps with paired curb ramps um, to give uh, people walking and biking a direct route into, the, into their crossing as opposed to sending them into the middle of the intersection. Um, we also, of course, recommended that all the curb ramps should have pedestrian detectable warnings. Um, for ADA compliance. Uh, and then we also recommended extending the sidewalks and adding bump outs in order to narrow the roadway crossings, slow vehicle travel speeds, and improve visibility so that people driving could see people walking and biking and people walking and biking could see uh, cars coming in their direction. Um, because as I mentioned before, there are several obstructed views. Um, and then uh, a big recommendation is turning the island into a legitimate pe pedestrian refuge um, for, for people walking and biking. Um, and then of course, adding bike racks. Uh, and uh, then the big interesting recommendation here is testing um, parking protected separated bicycle facilities. So as you can see on the left-hand side of the street, um, there is that green bike lane um, and on the inside on the east side the, there is a, a buffer and then there is um, a parking lane so uh, that is our proposed accommodation for bicycle travel at this location <clears throat> next slide so uh, when we brought this to the city of Chelsea, uh, they asked us if we could provide some recommendations for short-term uh, implementation, something that they could do quickly at a lower cost. And so we recommended essentially the same geometry reconfiguration, but instead of suggesting a whole redo of like the curbs and the, and the sidewalks, um, creating paint on the, using paint and bollards to create these sort of geometric um, reconstruct, reconstructing the geometry without actually having to do reconstruction. Um, so hopefully they're able to implement some of these recommendations and we can see a quick change to the area and, um, and hopefully it'll improve safety and comfort for all users at the location. All right, on to the next slide. So the next location is Lynn. Um, as you can see here, uh, it's a, it's a 
pretty big intersection. There's two lanes um, coming into the from the south, uh, going north, one way along Liberty Street, and then there's one lane each direction um, going on Washington Street. So just south of the intersection, if you follow Liberty Street down. Um, there is Market Street um, and the Northern Strand Community Path is going to separate into two different um, routes. There's gonna be a more of a shared use path, but then there will be a separated on-road bicycle facility that will travel down South Common Street and into downtown Lynn along Market Street. And because Liberty Street intersects Market Street, uh, provid providing safe and comfortable bicycle accommodations along the roadway would expand Lynn's bicycle network. Uh, continue. Uh, so this is a picture I took while I was visiting the intersection, just to give you a little taste of the area. Um, the issues and concerns that we identified while visiting um, are that the curb, all the curb ramps were apex and lacked pedestrian detectable warnings. Um, the pedestrian signal improvements um, that were needed are that none of them uh, were accessible pedestrian signals. And additionally, two of the pedestrian signal heads were actually facing the wrong direction. So pedestrians looking to cross in that direction would never actually know that they were allowed to walk. Um, so that would, and there, I did see a few people not really knowing whether to go and kind of just figuring it out, which is scary, especially when it's a rush hour and there are a lot of vehicles in the area. Um, the, there's a general lack of bicycle facilities, um, which, which is definitely something that we looked at. Um, and then there, the big thing at this location is that there are many points of potential conflict with the driveways, parking lots, and Central Street just to the south of the location. Next slide. So this is the conceptual design um, that we proposed for Lynn. Um, so this really, for, for people walking, we really just tightened up the intersection. We, we made the, uh, we made, as, as you can see, we provided paired curb ramps in our recommendations um, instead of instead of doing the having the apex curb ramps. Um, we narrowed, we were recommended that they narrow driveway curb cuts just to, to make it more um, difficult for people, people driving to quickly turn in and out or um, cut off anyone who might be walking or biking um, to, to make their turns more uh, deliberate. Um, we also, uh, at Lynn's request, uh, provided um, intersection clearance time adjustment recommendations. So we recalculated the intersection signal timing. Um, we also recommend that they install vehicle detection. Um, and we, of course, along with replacing the apex curb ramps with paired curb ramps, um, recommend that all of the curb ramps receive pedestrian detectable warnings to be ADA compliant. Um, and of course, fixing and upgrading the pedestrian signals. Um, adding bike racks to the location will improve bicycle travel in the area. Uh, and then testing separated bicycle facilities. So in this case, you can see um, we actually flipped the, the illustration in this recommendation to have the green for the bike lane through the intersections, uh, because that was actually part of our proposal. Um, given the fact that these are fairly busy intersections during, um, during a rush hour, the drawing attention to the fact that there is a, an area where you might expect someone to be biking um, is what seemed very important. Uh, and then we provided a buffer along the roadway to provide safety or, uh, and comfort to bicyclists traveling or people biking along the roadway. All right, next slide. <clears throat> Finally, we looked at Malden. Um, so here you can see that there's a bus stop right at the intersection. Also, not very far to the west is the Malden Center T-stop, which is not only a T-stop, but also has a lot of buses that go through the area. Um, it's a very busy location and by far the biggest intersection we looked at through this study. Uh, next slide. This is a picture that I took of the intersection when visiting, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, and the issues and concerns that we identified, this is of course across the board, we identified a lot of apex curb ramps um, and, uh, and fading crosswalks. Uh, the intersection geometry here uh, was kind of the biggest concern. Uh, it created really wide turning radii, which increases vehicle turning speeds and reduces pedestrian visibility. Just it's harder for um, someone who is 
walking to be seen by someone who is driving um, when, when they're hidden further back from the intersection. Um, and then the general lack of bicycle facilities was something we really wanted to address through this study. Uh, next slide. So this is the conceptual design that we proposed for Malden. Um, so again, we re re recommended replacing the apex curb ramps with paired curb ramps and giving all of the curb ramps pe pedestrian detectable warnings. Um, we also recommended adding leading pedestrian intervals, or if that were not possible or not something that would that um, Malden wanted to do, to do uh, to add no turn on red signage in order to make it safer for pedestrian or people walking and biking to cross at the intersection. Um, we also recommended modifying the medians to create pedestrian refuges. As you can see, there are medians on um, three of the four legs of the intersection. So this would be a reworking of of existing infrastructure to make it um, safer for people walking and biking and to provide increased comfort. Um, <clears throat> we also recommended extending the sidewalks at the corners to reduce turning radii. So just creating a little bit more to make things a little bit tighter so that uh, people driving have to really pay attention when they're taking these turns. Um, we also, of course, recommend adding bike racks to location. And then we have two separate bicycle facilities that we recommend testing, um, a separated bicycle facility along Center Street on both sides of the roadway. And as well, we wanted to add sidewalk level, a sidewalk level bike lane um, to Main Street to the south because the, there is a connection to the Northern Strand Community Path just feet to the south. So a few hundred feet to the south. So it, it's a very important connection and it would be a missed opportunity to not make that a recommendation through our work. <clears throat> All right, next slide. And that's it. Thank you very much. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Casey. Questions for Casey? Daniel Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to say, um, Casey and also uh, Chen Yun, I really like the, um, this work is really, really good. So I really appreciate it. Um, uh, one comment, well, a comment and maybe a couple of questions. Um, when it comes to the, the intersection, the crash diagrams, the maps that you had are really good and really interesting. Uh, my one comment on them is that I think on the lower right it shows the uh, it shows the uh, legend for the injury severity showing the little circles. Um, it says like injury accident or fatal accident. I think those should be trained to injury crash or fatal crash so that it's uh, aligns with you know moving towards a language that is some more accurate and, and more neutral than accident, which, you know, accident assumes that nobody's at fault or there's nothing that can be done. So I think changing that to crash would be a good idea. Um, so uh, Casey, on, on the questions, um, so on the last one on Malden, I, I'm sorry, I missed, uh, I think, a few minutes of that. Um, but I was sort of wondering why the bike lane proposal wasn't going further north along the, the main street. Um, and then on, on Chelsea, I was sort of curious as to, you had the um, flexible bollards proposed in the temporary, but not in the permanent situation. So I just, just a couple of, you know, detail questions about those. Yeah, no, those are all good questions. And uh, that accident versus crash point, uh, that was a major oversight on my part because that is something that I really care about. I, I actually don't know how I missed that. So I'm very sorry. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. It, it was not just yours, it was on the other ones too, so. Uh, okay, well, I'll, well, when we actually post it to the website, um, not on just the agenda, uh, I, will, I will make sure that that's updated. So thank you. Um, with the Malden um, not extending it north of the intersection, the, the bicycle facilities, uh, ideally that would be wonderful. It's just that there was a more constrained roadway up, up there. So there wasn't as much space to play with. I think it would be a really interesting idea to look into. It's just, I didn't feel comfortable saying that there was enough space for um, separated bicycle facilities when, when I couldn't find it, I guess. But um, if Malden would be able to 
reconfigure and find that that'd be fantastic. And our major emphasis too was providing the connection to the Northern Strand community path. Um, although there are definitely bicyclists that I saw traveling north of the intersection who are people biking who would really probably very be very happy with the accommodation. Um, and with the Chelsea intersection, the question was, oh, the flexible bollards. So um, we only included the flexible bollards in the, um, in the short-term improvements recommendation because they, there would be actual concrete like sidewalks with the, with the um, curbing in it, where the uh, intersection would be extended, but where the intersection um, pedestrian refuge would be extended. But I, are, you, are you pointing out that, uh, are you looking at the separated area between the bike lane and the roadway? Is that what you're thinking with flexible bollards? Oh yeah, that's I was talking about the um, yes, the bike lane buffer that you're showing there is a temporary measure. You know, it looks very similar to the permanent measure. You know, but one has bollards and a temporary measure, and one doesn't, and it's still parking protected. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, so I think I think that that's something I'll look at. I I feel like. I thought I included the flexible bollards in, in both for the bike lane for the separation, but it, I'm, I'm going to go and check. Um, sorry about that. But yes, the idea is to actually provide just as much, if not more protection in the uh, longer term. I'm, more, I'm on the phone, okay. More costly option. So uh, okay. thank you for that point. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Very, uh, very uh, good work, Casey. Uh, just a question of uh, in your discussions with the, the three cities, um, did the issue or topic of the AD, the city's ADA transition plans come up and whether there was an opportunity to perhaps piggyback on work that's already planned or scheduled as part of the city's ADA transition plans? Um, that didn't come up. Uh, however, I, our, our work is is really supposed to help the city identify issues. So if if this can factor into their ADA transition plans, I, I don't think that we propose our work thinking that it should just happen within a void. I think that the idea is to present the work to the municipality so that they can then understand what needs to be done and be able to prioritize their work. And, and ideally, yeah, um, tie efforts in so that you're saving money and time an effort so it hasn't come up but hopefully uh, I can even email them and just suggest it just just to make sure that they know about it because I think that's a really really good point uh, just, just as a follow-up just just to be you know clear I mean ADA transition plans are required uh, for every municipality or government agency and, and so it, it may be useful information for you yeah uh, to look at their ADA transition plans uh, you know as part of your data collection for the I think that's a really good if they don't have an ADA transition plan, <laughs> uh, it would be great if you could encourage them. Yes. <laughs> Very good point. Well, as, as mm -hmm. last week, the uh, intersection improvement program was approved, I will definitely keep that in mind in that new project. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions for Casey? Seeing none, thank you very much, Casey. Thank you. Next item is member items. Anybody have any items today? Tom Kansas. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, David, I'm taking this time for member items to say that after 43 years with the city of Boston and uh, 22 odd years with the MPO, I'm resigning effective uh, May 31. And I just wanted to let the, MP, uh, the MPO know that given that this is our last meeting in May. So, so take it, no more meetings in May. Um, you know, let me just say this. When I started with the MPO, there were six members and uh, there was the relationships between the municipalities and various parties in the state. Sometimes they were fraught. Um, and a lot of times just for a lack of miscommunication or, or no communication, but over the years, there's been a number of incremental changes, a number of significant changes in terms of voting. Uh, it's now what, up to 19 members. Um, and I think there's a good level of trust and collaboration. Uh, we all know the 500 pound gorilla in the room and I wish the NPO luck is it 
is it takes on, you know, an ongoing challenge to it as far as the uh, project cost increases and whether you want to, how are you going to do that? Whether you bring in cost effectiveness items that have been bantered about or not. Um, so, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'd say, um, I'd say thank you. And I'd say to the members, uh, thanks to the members, uh, I certainly recognize your commitment. I think that there's been one variable, uh, constant variable in those enhancements or the, the, the improvements of the MPO, and, and that's Dave Moeller. Um, Dave, I tip my cap to you. Uh, you've been the constant as, as the MPO has, has gone from well, one place to, I think, a better place. And uh, I also recognize uh, MAPC and, uh, and Eric Barasa and for the role that they've played. Uh, sometimes as referees, sometimes is is the one to, to lead the charge uh, where, where others may not be able to. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, anybody I've worked with from CTPS, I've enjoyed working with. Um, I really have. Uh, I appreciate your professionalism and, 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 and you're nice people to work with. Mr. Chair, thanks a lot. I wish the MPO a lot going forward. Thanks for the opportunity to, to say sayonara. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. Thank Jim, you, Dave. Do you want to say something? I do. I just want to, you know, acknowledge Tom. He's um, been the city's MPO guru for decades. I've learned so much from him. Um, he's, I think, uh, been a fantastic MPO member, a great asset to the MPO. Been just a, a great collaborator and contributor to, to the MPO. And um, personally, uh, he's a good friend, great mentor for me. Um, I remember meeting Tom way back in 1998, when I was at MAPC uh, working as a transportation planner, and and there was a great tip coordinator. I think his name was David Moeller back then. Uh, <laughs> but any event, I think Tom's been such a great great member of the MPO for decades, and, and a great great asset for the city. And I think we'll miss him dearly, and hopefully try to, to replace all his knowledge and skill and talent that he's brought to the MPO. So just wanted to say thanks to Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Those are kind words. Tom Bent. Uh, I just want to congratulate Tom on his uh, retirement. Uh, well deserved, Tom. Uh, but I also, uh, I know when I, I said uh, when, when I when I first came in, uh, talking with Tom and you know helping me through the ropes, uh, and then um, all the conversations, some late night ones uh, during the whole grueling GLX process, getting it over the line. Uh, and among other um, uh, among other major projects that have been done during, while Tom has been uh, at the helm for the city of Boston, uh, I always felt like uh, I, I had a, a great uh, mentor to go back to, to to help me through some of the uh, issues. And like I'd say to Tom, "What the hell does this mean?" You know, <laughs> and he would he would he would let me know. You know, and uh, or he'd say to me, "What are you thinking here?" You know. So I really appreciated all that, and I've really enjoyed. Uh, uh, not only the meetings, but uh, also uh, lunches after the meetings. Uh, it was always a fun time. But so congratulations and uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Marie? I was just trying to unmute myself. Congratulations, Tom. I didn't realize you were retiring because I haven't been to a meeting in a while. But uh, well, I think you're too young. Close to the best. You're too young to retire, Tom. Well, 43 years, it's- uh, You started when you were like 12? No, it was, uh, I, I think I was six weeks out of college and I, I, I went in to see somebody and I got a job and I said, darn it, I thought that I'd have the summer off. <laughs> I think it was June 28th and it's been pretty steady since then. Um, no, thanks, Marie. Uh, it, it's been great working with Mass Dodd. Um, I can't speak enough about, I mean, every municipality knows when you're dealing with a project, there were always differences of opinion about some of the details or schedule or whatever, but I, I can't say enough about uh, how Mastod has, has been a partner uh, with Boston and, and from what I've seen with, with all the other municipalities. And I'd just like to say, you know, people saying to me and Jim, uh, everybody, it's great. You know, of course we'd have to recognize Jim Galuli who 
you know, who was who was the true guru. And so, yeah, the city, you know, the, the city's got some people in, in reserve who've been following this, who'll be taking over. Jim Galuli left uh, 18 months ago, a few years ago. Um, Jim didn't come to every meeting, but I certainly did. And Tom, that's right. Those, those lunches downstairs, I miss them. Uh, there's so much that I hope the NPO gets back to person to person meeting because during a break, you can go over to a member. You, you can say, Jay, what's this? You don't understand. You, you just, uh, and we're missing that in, uh, with, with the Zoom stuff. So I hope that, I hope that within, I don't know, what are they talking about? Uh, end of the summer or fall that, that you guys can get back together again. Yeah. But Jim? thanks, Marie. Thanks. Jim? Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. I, I, I too, I just want to say congratulations, Tom. Uh, it's been great working with you for maybe not quite, I have not me 43 years, but uh, it's, it feels that way sometimes. You know, I started at CPPS. I then went to MassDOT and now I'm at Federal Highway. I don't know if I'm going forward or backward, but uh, it was great working with you and all the different roles that I've had. Uh, well, yeah, so. clearly, and I can you, clearly, can you go on backwards? <laughs> No, no, I appreciate that. And, and the members of the NPO may not realize that Ken was really at ground zero with all this stuff too. And Ken was at Mass Dodd and Ken was on the board and Ken represented uh, represented the Commonwealth and, and he's over at FHWA now. And uh, yeah, Ken, th thanks for all, all you do for the NPO and uh, your comments. I, whenever you give a comment, my ears always perk up, perk, perk up, and you've got a lot of good points, uh, and and um, and I think it really serves the MPO well. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, Tom. I'll take the final one. Um, it's been great working with you. Always, you know. I I, I guess we've known each other twenty seven years, probably, and we're yep. close to all that time. Um, it's always been a pleasure. I'm I'm going to miss you both personally and professionally, and at these meetings, it, it, your, your comments are always well taken. Um, you should be really proud of yourself, and, and, and we were lucky to have you. Everybody clap for Tom. Okay, only my clap got heard because everybody else is on mute. Thank, thank you, David. Thank, thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Any other items to come before the board? Seeing none, Tom, why don't you make the motion to adjourn for me? Mr. Chair, I make the motion to adjourn today's MPO meeting. Thank you, Tom Bent. Unmute Tom Bent. <laughs> I'll second the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Without objection, we are adjourned. Take care, Tom. Yep, see you later. Thank you, everybody. Take care. See you around campus, hopefully. I hope so. Yep. <laughs>